We all know that the right habits and mindsets can be transformational in how we live our lives. But among the sea of advice online, it can be challenging to know who to trust with these important life decisions. At The Standard, we answer those questions and introduce you to some of the most successful people in the world in their fields and the habits and the mindsets they've used to achieve their success. To learn more about our social platform, head on over to www.thestandardapp.com. And now, your host, myself, Chris Pellatroni. Welcome to another episode of The Standard. I am your host, Chris Palatroni, and today's guest is Alec Crockford. He is a fitness influencer, a model, an actor. This guy does so many different things. He's based out of London, and as you will hear, and if you visit one of his channels, you will quickly see this guy takes immaculate care of himself. Um, I had a fabulous conversation with him. Felt like I could have probably talked to him for a couple of hours. Uh, we dive into everything from morning routines and journaling, gratitude, meditation, uh, the power of a nighttime routine that supports that morning routine. We get into mindsets and sort of the chasing ambition versus enjoying the journey. We talk a little bit about coaching and challenges that people have as they're on their fitness journey. I'm asking some questions around the vanity of physical fitness because I think that's important. Uh, but as you'll hear from Alec, he is a wealth of knowledge. I think he has a phenomenal perspective and he also has a really big heart. Uh, we do get into some of the habits that we believe would help humanity be a more loving place. The key there is love. And so I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So without further ado, I want to welcome Alec Crockford. Great. Happy Monday. How are you? Yeah, doing well. Thank you very much. I've just come back from the gym. I cycled there and back as well. So it's a big activity day and I'm feeling good. Nice. Is uh, are you, do you do cardio as well? Or are you more just lifting weights or like what's your, what's your workout look like these days? Well, I follow a, um, yeah, a weightlifting program, but around and outside of that, I'm, I'm getting on the bike quite a lot. I'm walking a lot. I'm playing tennis once a week as well. So I just allow the, the active lifestyle to, to um, be the cardio supplement around the weightlifting plan. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I've, I, yeah. I have a personal trainer for weightlifting and I've never enjoyed weightlifting. It's just not, I love running. And so anything I can do in nature and get out there. Um, but I think probably about four years ago, I started to really recognize, especially as I get older, that to be a better runner and to have more longevity, strength training was a very uh, integral part of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm still on my weightlifting journey, if you will, getting better at it. But uh, uh, I'll kid you not, I'd always yeah. rather duck into the hills than go to the gym. So yeah. Yeah, it's essential. The, the balance is important. It's great to have that time in nature and, and do the cardio, but the strength is really central as well. What have you found since you don't generally enjoy it? What part of it allows you to enjoy it more or what parts are you starting to like? You know, for me, it started with, I went to, well, it started with my wife. She went to F45. Um, I don't know if they have that um, where you're at, but, um, but I started doing that. And, you know, I'm a, I'm an introvert, believe it or not. So I was always more comfortable just being by myself, being in nature, whatnot. Um, but I really enjoyed the group aspect. Um, even though I wasn't there to like chat it up with everybody, I really enjoyed the the structure that F45 provided. There was a visual as to how to do every exercise. Uh, you were sort of in your own little bubble, but you were connected to a broader group of, you know, 20 to 30 people. And it's also a little bit like a club environment. They've got loud music. So you're sort of getting all that. And it's, and it's just you're in for 45 minutes and you're out. And so that structure... I really enjoyed and I did that for a couple of years. And then I went to a personal trainer to see if I could take my fitness or my, my weight training to like another level. And she's phenomenal. So I really enjoy spending some time with her. But in all honesty, the big thing for me when it comes to weightlifting, and it's one of the very few things that I need is I need accountability. Like I'm not, I'm not that guy without a, without going to a class or paying for a trainer I find it very hard to be focused and to want to go in my backyard or, or do something. Running is no problem, 
So for me, it's a little bit of both. It's like the, the community aspects. I still do F45. I have a personal trainer. I work out about five days a week. Um, and those are the things that really help out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think what you're saying about the community is, is so important as well, because that, that is the accountability as well, showing up for other people, being a part of a group. It just adds another element into the working out, which is for ourselves. But when you, when you're there and you get the, the energy of everybody else and the loud music, which you can have in a, yeah, a, a boutique gym studio or in your earphones in the gym it's just creating that atmosphere for yourself to make it more than just the weightlifting, yeah. but the experience the time for yourself that element really really is a big part yeah well i've got so many things i want to cover with you um a little in stalker fashion you know i've 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 talked to you a couple times i've done a a fairly deep dive on your background and i think you've got a lot of really cool perspectives that I want to make sure we weave into this. But for those people that don't know you, um, rather than me uh, leave something out in your background, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background as to your fitness journey, what you're doing. Um, I know you've got an app. I know you're an actor. You're quite uh, popular on social media. So maybe just give us a little bit of context as to like, who is Alec and what is he doing and why is he helping so many people out there? Yeah, I um I started out always being in fitness and sports. I played a lot of um football and basket my basketball when I was young myself. And then I always knew that whilst in school and college my life was going to start out at least in the sports or fitness world. And that took me to personal training naturally and I was a personal trainer for 7 or 8 years. But whilst doing that I started to enjoy loving loving the time one to one with clients but I knew that I wanted to help more people than just that one to one ability. So my my head started to think about what I could do at the same time as social media started to come around at the same time as goals of wanting to be a fitness model and and uh, be on <laughs> magazine covers and all of these goals started to start to build up. So that evolved into creating an online brand and business and social media. And actually, when I got my first magazine cover, I then that gave me a bit of an oomph to launch an online product, which was a a twelve week program to to get to get a a physique and 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 achieve goals like this. So I I was really motivated, inspired to to get the goals and desires myself but to help others achieve it as well. And I had a taste for entrepreneurism and business so much so that I started to evolve that business further and do less and less personal training to the point where I was able to take that further, launch it into the app that it is now. And over the years, I've been on quite a journey from just fitness and physique to mental health to the whole mindset of health and fitness and really the the wellness space as a whole rather than just the six pack abs and the, and the chisel chest and all of that and being on that journey myself has really um awakened myself up to knowing that that is really what I would love to do with my service to the world and to people and provide a uh, an inspiration provide uh, a platform that helps people go on that journey as well to become fitter and healthier but happier as a whole and looking after their whole uh, wellness approach um alongside that my goals and desires never end you mentioned um acting and things like this and yeah i these desires just start to build over the years and I've I've started to take action on them bit bit by bit because one of my beliefs is also to to go after your dreams, go after your goals, and um, live life and and have an adventure, and that anything and everything is possible. Like I go back to when I had those fitness model goals, and I was that teenage boy that would collect a, a magazine and see the the fitness model on the front, and I thought, how can I 
how can I be that guy? How can I, first of all, get a body like that? And then secondly, how do I get to be on the cover of the magazine? And I remember thinking how impossible it was. How is that ever going to be possible? So to make things like that possible and many other examples, I started to realize, well, what else do I currently think is impossible? And why don't I just start taking action towards them? And then pattern after pattern and achievement after achievement, small and big, I realize that we can create our reality. We can go after our dreams. And this really aligns with the whole health, fitness, wellness mindset. So when I'm helping people in their health and fitness, it's because I know that fitness is a gateway into increased confidence, increased relationships, um, quality, and the relationship with yourself, which then helps you in your whole entire life. And um, I love seeing the transformations people go through from it might just be fitness first, but then they start, they, they launch the business that they've always wanted, or they, they move to a location they've always wanted to go, or their relationships have improved, all these aspects, which I know are really integral to um, a happy life. So I now take action on all parts of my life and my business with those aspects in mind. How can I help people from this whole 360 approach? Yeah, there's there's so much to unpack in there. You made a statement a second ago, and I'm, I'm hopeful you can elaborate on it. Fitness is the gateway to a more fulfilling life. Why, why is that? Many different reasons. I would say, well, first of all, the, the obvious ones, like when you, when you focus on your, your health and your fitness, you become stronger, you become healthier, and that gives you freedom um, physically to, to be in less discomfort or <laughs> to, to have uh, the comfort to look after your children or grandchildren or to to live longer, all of these physical benefits. But then the health benefits, it's very well researched and proven that eating healthy and being physically active improves your mental health. So this is, this is an obvious gateway as well. And there's many other as aspects to that. But if there's some things that you can control quite quickly, which is your nutrition and your physical activity, then that's certainly a gateway to um, to be taken advantage of, and then and then, like I said, in regards to the the feeling of achievement and fulfillment, the simple tasks each day of um, going for a walk or getting in your workout is this feeling of achievement in your day that elevates your vibration, your energy, your mood, your positivity, which has this catalytic effect to the rest of your life. And sometimes people look at a fit person and think, oh, how do they wake up and just feel so positive and amazing? <laughs> but the truth is, those people often have a morning routine or have a process that gets them into that mindset. They don't always just wake up like that, but I choose to wake up and, and whether it's, it's the walk or the meditation or, or the stretching session, that actually energizes my body and my mind to have the positivity. Yeah. So I think these are, these are the key reasons. What, what would you say? So I'm, I'm an avid believer in taking incredible care of ourselves. And, you know, this conversation could go in so many di different directions because clearly the taking care of yourself physically has profound effects on yourself mentally, uh, spiritually. Um, however, I do recognize as well that there's a lot of vanity in the individual you know, getting six pack abs or getting a bikini body, it's, you're, you're not purely doing it all the time for, I want to live longer. I want to live healthier. There's an aesthetic component to it and there's a social component to it. Um, I, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that the most dominant sense we have as a human being is vision. 
And the way we see ourselves has very profound effects on our thought process and to your point earlier, our beliefs. Um, and so I'm a big believer that even if you are choosing your fitness journey more from a vanity perspective versus a health perspective, that it has this sort of trickle down effect that when you go through that, the morning routine, the evening routine, you learn to eat healthier, you learn better sleep habits. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. I think over time, even though if there is a vanity component to it, you start to realize that there is disproportionately a mental component to it as well. And it affects your self-confidence and so forth. So I'm curious from your perspective, like, yes, there is a health and there's a longevity, uh, but I have to imagine that there are probably a number of people that you've worked with over the years that are like, look, I just want to look cut. I just want to have a bikini body. And I don't think that's wrong, but I'm just curious, like if you would agree with the fact that we are vain to some extent, um, and there's nothing wrong with that because how we see ourselves can play huge impacts into the way we choose to live our lives. I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts on like looking at it from that lens as well? Yeah, I think the the aesthetics and, and wanting to look good is um, is a valid is a valid desire, and it's all about the balance of all of these things. And often, yeah, you're right. A lot of the people I work with or talk to, their their entire goal is to to look better and often i think sell them what they want and give them what they need so the to, so deep down i know that mm, if i can if i can help them look better and in the process and the long term approach inspire them to to have a deeper journey then that's a win as well so yes i I know that the appeal of looking good, you see them on social media. I, I know I know the Instagram game and um, I know people do want to look good. They want to they want to build muscle. They want to be lean. And this isn't always the vision of healthy, even though I try to um, show all aspects of that. Um, so, yeah, I it's a great way to bring people in. And if they see those initial benefits of losing some weight or changing the shape of their body and then start to experience, because that's probably going to be maybe the first bit of motivation that keeps them hooked and, and keeps them applying the habits that they're building. And then if they're able to maintain those habits and experience other benefits that are mental health related or, or general health related that aren't just visual, then that is a more sustainable approach to habit building that hopefully enables them to have a fit and healthy life rather than get shredded for Ibiza in four weeks time. <laughs> yeah, well said, well said. Um, all right, let's dive into you. Um, I am so curious, you know, clearly what, what I love about talking with people that are in the fitness space is, you know, I could look at your Instagram feed or your YouTube and I clearly can see you wear your habits on you, right? You don't get to be in the type of shape that you are on the cover of magazines uh, without having some pretty solid habits. And I'm aware that they're quite extensive. Um, but, you know, this podcast is about highlighting like a habit and it's about highlighting a mindset. Uh, the one habit that you feel profoundly impacts your mental health, your well-being, your overall success at this stage of your life. And so I'm curious for you, what is that habit? Like, what is the one thing that you do daily, weekly, monthly that really supports you and sort of stands above the rest at this time? Yeah, it's very difficult. <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> um, some, sometimes um, you, you take for granted your habits, thinking either they're normal or they're not a habit because they're so conditioned a part of you. So it does take self-reflection and um, analysis of your life to realize what's unique to your lifestyle. Um, if I could just give it an umbrella term, first of all, as the morning routine, and then see if I can pinpoint aspects of the morning routine that are critical. Um, and I would say that the morning routine is so important because it's t it's selfish time it's time that i find for me that is for me and if i wake up and go straight into 
service mode, which I spend hopefully the majority of the rest of my day in, then I'm just giving from an empty cup rather than filling myself up first and making sure that I'm um, from a mind, body, spirit approach um, full. And parts of that morning routine are physical and, and are spiritual and are mental. And there are, of course, days where I've got to wake up and jump on a train within 20 minutes or, or take phone calls or whatever. But I, I let those days slide because the majority of the time, my morning routine is, is the same or dedicated to me. So that is like no, no technology time for, a, for a, a period of time. That is apart from just maybe checking for emergencies on WhatsApp or something. And if everything's all good, then don't, don't go into social media or emails. Getting out into sunlight, getting, getting real natural light on my skin, in my eyes, so I can wake up without getting um, electronics in my, in my face, as well as actually that energizing my body. Many times I wake up and I'm stiff from training or I feel lethargic but actually moving my body in a low intensity way energizes me so that when I'm back from a 20 or 30 minute walk, um, I feel, I feel great. And then I go into uh, like a stretch or a foam rolling session whilst either listening to uh, something that varies, whether it's a podcast or a video that's um, maybe more spiritual or, or mindset based rather than, um, rather than just binge watching something for the, for the sake of it kind of thing. Um, and then often I would end that stretching session with meditation or going, going inwards, whether that's just closing my eyes and meditating, whether that's focusing on gratitude or whether that's journaling, um, depending on the day and how things are going. And then I feel ready to, to wash up, get going for my day and start opening the rest of my life. So there are, there are four or five key aspects of that morning routine. Um, so which one should I nail down onto? Well, let's, let's, um, let's stay more macro just for a second here, just cause you've, you've leaned into like a routine that has lots of different components to it. Um, I guess a few questions I would have is like, when does this morning routine begin for you? Like, what's that look like from your perspective? I do prioritize sleep and um, I'm not the best in regards to getting to bed on time sometimes. So <laughs> the, the other side of the coin of a morning routine is the evening mm -hmm. routine. Of course, the best, the best morning routine starts with yep. a good evening routine. Okay. Otherwise it's pointless. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I've created a life where I don't need to wake up at the break of dawn. Like when I was a personal trainer, I used to take sessions at 6am, but I don't do that anymore. And um, I find myself productive after I've had a good seven, eight hours sleep. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a, a seven o'clock normally beginning or, or something like that, 7am where I get outside. Yeah. Um, so that I, I, it's normally about eight or eight thirty where I'm, I'm starting my work day, which is, um, which is a, a decent time to start work. So you're, you're, and I'm glad you brought it up too, because all good morning routines begin with a solid evening routine. We, we well know that uh, there's a lot to be said about preparing your environment, make things as easy as possible, whether you're preparing your cup of coffee or laying your clothes out for your workout or your computer. Um, I would always uh, encourage people to do as much stuff in the evening time, because let's just face it, uh, especially for yeah. those people that do wake up really early. I wake up in the 3.30, yeah. 4 o'clock range. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not that motivated to like put water in my coffee pot, you know what I mean? And then go find my laptop and where's my mouse or whatever it is that I'm choosing to do. So evening routines definitely set the stage for a solid morning routine. For you, though, you're waking up seven and your morning routine is about an hour and a half, it sounds like. Is that right? Up about an hour if I'm if I'm on it and productive, an hour and a half if I'm taking it slow. <laughs> okay, perfect. So before we dive into a component, if you can add a little bit of clarity as to like why is this so important for you? 
Like, have you always been a morning routine person? And, you know, what happens if you don't do your morning routine? I know you said there's sometimes you may hop on a train or it, there's some scheduling issue that doesn't allow you to do this. Uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to what happens when you don't get the opportunity to have this me time to, to cultivate these particular habits. What, what happens then and why so important? I went through a phase of thinking that I'm nothing without my morning routine and, and, and I, I hate my day if I don't get that time and space that I've, that I've created for myself in my normal day. But then I've come around to the idea that actually my morning routine on one of those days really actually benefits me on the days that I can't do it. It's actually <laughs> that morning routine is for the days where I'm not able to do it. It gives me the the balance. It gives me the headspace. It gives me the physical mobility and clarity for the days that I do have to wake up much earlier and go do something or, or take calls or have meetings or travel or whatever. So I'm now at the stage thinking that I don't need the morning routine on those days because the majority of the days that I do have the morning routine. So yeah, I'm and that's only going to benefit my day from a mindset perspective. Yeah. You don't want to go forward in your day thinking today's rubbish because I didn't get to do my stretching kind of thing. That's, <laughs> that's not going to be the best approach to your day from a, from a mindset point of view. So I've, um, yeah, I've come around to the idea that actually it doesn't matter as long as the majority of my time I am having that, that standard morning routine. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective, too. And, you know, I share a similar one, regardless of which habit or routine it is. Um, it reminds me. <laughs> so me and my wife will joke, too, when you say you don't let uh, if you don't do your morning routine, don't let it sabotage your day. There'll be times where, you know, we just sleep in for whatever reason. And it's it's hard not to have that self judgment of like, oh, my God, I did. I didn't wake up when I said I was going to. I just lost, in our case, you know, we wake up at seven. We just lost three hours of our day. We've got two kids. Uh, we're not going to regain that time. Like, it's just, it's lost. And there are times where we both look at each other and like, did we just throw the whole day away? Like, we just lost the me time. Um, and I think we've had to constantly work on recalibrating that thought process to use those days that we do it to hopefully be more compassionate towards ourselves. Uh, but also to remind ourselves, why do we wake up early? You know, uh, wh why are those morning routines so important? And so I think we've gotten better where we're not so judgy, uh, but it does help us remember like, hey, today is what it is. And this is why we wake up early. And so that that yeah. is a nice way to kind of recalibrate it. And also, what what is it that your body needed? What, sure. Like the, the other benefits of, of um, those three hours of sleeping, like this is... This is the other thing that I, I got today. I had additional rest and um, and maybe that's what I needed today. And then you move forwards from where you are. Well, let me ask you a question on that. I had, um, I remember one of the first podcasts we did on this was with Freya Mortensen and uh, she's an empath coach, really big on mindsets. And I remember her saying to me, she's like, Chris, she's like, we were talking about sleeping in and she's like, some days I just sleep in. And I'm like, well, hold on, Freya. Like you, you like. Like you're very habitual in some ways. And she's like, I know, but I have to listen to my body. I have to be very, uh, I have to use my intuition. And I'm like, okay, great. So on that day you sleep in, like, are you casting any judgment on yourself? And she's like, no, she's like, that's what my body needed that day. And so my question to her, which I'd love you to, to, to give some feedback on is how do you not cast judgment on yourself and lean into intuition? Because clearly you are aware that habits and routines are fundamental to living the type of life that you want. And so I think there's this balance or gradient, if you will, of be very regiment. I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. I said I would do it at this time. I'm going to do it. But then there's also this, well, listen to your body. What do you need? Do you need more social interaction? Do you need more sleep? Do you need more rest? Should you not go on that run or do that workout? Like, how do you reconcile the I have this habit mindset that I should be sticking to versus leaning into intuition and following that path without casting too much judgment on yourself. Yeah, it's a very important point because habits by definition are 
very rigid, very strict. Generally, it's, uh, it's this way and it's always this way and doesn't allow for the ebbs and flows and, and, the, and the, the journey of life, which is not static and not the same always. So having the structure of your habits and the understanding of, of what they are and how they benefit you and why you love them with this space, like you said, the balance, the space and the openness to feel into your intuition is really, really important. And to also notice the difference between an excuse and the intuition and yes, not, not having the, um, not having the judgment. And if you truly listen to your intuition and tapping into your, your heart, your body, and not, I said, I'll do this and I'm stubborn and I have to do this whilst your body is screaming, saying, don't do this. I've been through those phases a lot. And, um, and it just runs, runs me down deeper in the wrong direction. And I find that listening to my intuition and my body and for those signals gives me the, the balance and the space to, um, to follow it. And, and, often, and often rewarded in the right ways so that I can, um, I can be more consistent in the long run or edit and adjust my life habits and work-life balance and routines in a way that is more sustainable and aligned to the direction that I'm going in, in, in all the aspects of my life. So yes, it is this balance of the structured habits, but staying in tune with, with yourself, your body about what it is you actually need in the, in the moment. But how, how do you when decide you at that crossroad though, Alec? Like, when you talk about the excuse that you may be giving to yourself versus the intuition, I remember we had John Oblodgett on this. He's a, he's a Spartan world champion. So, I mean, he's an athlete. I mean, this is what this guy does for a living. And I asked him a similar question. I was like, but how do you know? Like, how do you know when you're at that crossroad of, am I making up an excuse or am I actually following my intuition? And I think for very seasoned people, trial and error will sort of, you know, more or less lead you in the right direction. But let's be honest, like, especially with people that are coming to you for coaching in the beginning, like, I mean, excuses run rampant. So how do you, for you, make that decision? You're standing at that crossroad of excuse on one side versus intuition. How do you know you're making the right decision? If the excuse, if it's an excuse, then there's usually something behind the excuse. There's a, there's a reason for not wanting to do something so it's it's very very intangible very very uh very deep i think about just trying to think about how to elaborate on this but if it's an excuse it's normally linked to a fear or a negativity of some form and i think you'd normally have a very clear feeling. I think we all have a strong intuition if we listen hard enough about, well, I don't want to, I don't want to do that because uh, I don't know. I don't like, I don't like the person there or I'm actually going there because I'm, I'm in fear of resting. I mean, I, I, I've conditioned myself to work, work and overwork that I don't know what it feels like to rest all of these feelings that could be attached to an excuse rather than the intuition of, of allowing something new or something different in could be attached to something more of an excited, uh, an aligned, enthusiastic feeling. So I don't think I can give like a black and white answer apart from, yeah, practice of the relationship with yourself over time. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's tough. I, I think for myself, one that comes up to me a lot is, so I'm a runner. I've been running for 20 years. Um, 
if I had to be completely honest, I pride myself on the fact that like I run 40 miles a week. Like I, like I just, my identity is associated with that. And running is not just about mental health or purely about physical, but like, I like that identity. And so I do a 13 mile run every week. And there are just times when you're working out five days a week, you're doing other stuff, you're running so much, like my body's always sore. Um, and there'll be times where I'm on this 13 mile run and I'm only like a mile or two into it. And I'm like, God, my body just does not feel great. Like it just, it's not, I'm not like a spring chicken, if you will. And there'll be a few times where I'm like, I just don't feel like doing it today. And then I tell myself, I'm like, but you said you'd do it. You've always done it. If you don't do it, you won't be able to say you did 40 miles this week. You'll, you'll have only done whatever, you know, 30 or whatnot. And I have like this, it's only probably like maybe 30 to 60 seconds where I'm debating with myself as to like, do I, do I concede and, you know, turn around or do I push forward knowing that it's probably going to be painful? And there is like a little bit of a flash of like, well, if I really am sore, what would be the negative consequence physically for me pushing through? Um, I'll be honest with you. There's no time that I ever go back home, but there is this moment where I'm like, God, am I, am I going forward because I just want to stick to the habit? And I rarely listen to the intuition. Now I've never injured myself to, to such extent that I've regretted that decision, but I do have those moments. Um, that's probably the one that like comes up the most for me. Um, yeah, and it's, it's tough. Like, I don't, I don't know how to reconcile that other than just trial and error. And, you know, you make maybe the wrong decision and you can reflect back and be like, man, like I had this feeling, but I didn't listen to it. And, and that's probably the best that I can get on that. Yeah. For the most part, I'd say that a lot, a lot of like the, the mindset you have and the mental strength and resilience you have to always push through that and stick to what you say you do is an incredible trait an incredible characteristic and strength that most people need to practice and, and experience <laughs> and would probably really help them on their health and fitness journey to gain some kind of integrity to doing what they said they'd, they'd do rather than just for the first week before the motivation dips and they go back to their old habits so for the most part i think that is a very strong habit to have and then i'm just wondering yeah, that I, I can relate to aspects of those stories myself with myself when I've pushed through and and been stubborn with with doing something and regretting it because of the injuries. You said you haven't regretted it because of you haven't had injuries. Um, but often it's a very fine line of like go going all the way to laziness or <laughs> or um re reducing and, and adjusting your habits and looking deeper into why am I doing this? What am I doing? Like, um, yeah, you, you've created this identity that you love with, with running 40 miles a week, but, um, who are you without that identity? <laughs> it's, it's a deep, deep question. Yeah. Um, but where, yeah, how would you look at yourself or how would you express yourself, um, without that, identity and parts of life is sometimes breaking identities down and, and building new ones up and and um or, or yeah allowing other aspects to come through i don't know the answer is just interesting interesting topics of conversation yeah it actually segues i want to ask a couple more questions on your routine and then we'll we'll sort of pivot over to a mindset but in this morning routine, there's these different habits that you have. And the one that I'm most interested in, maybe you can talk a little bit about, is you said that there's this time for uh, mindfulness or meditation. And I think you described it as, you know, sometimes it's more gratitude related. Sometimes it's more journal related. Other times it might be an actual meditation. Um, I took the impression that it's not the same all the time. It sort of oscillates between a variety of different things. Um, why is that so important for you? And if it is gratitude or, or maybe even journaling, like what exactly are you journaling about? Like what, what type of questions are you asking yourself? Because I think that's when we start to think about identity and like issues we run into. I think journaling is such a powerful tool, even if it's not pen to paper, maybe you do it in a different way. But, but talk to me a little bit about like, why is those those habits right there, the journaling, the gratitude, the mindfulness, why is that so important to your morning routine? Mostly this period of time is actually to 
to get out my own way, to get out of my head, to disconnect, to reconnect. And by that, I mean more of a spiritual practice than anything else, meaning we spend a lot of time with the energy, with, with uh, information coming externally in, continuously on our devices, continuously receiving information with our eyes open, etc. cetera. Um, so this time is really to actually remember that I'm not my body. I'm a soul. I'm connected to the universe, God, whatever you'd like to describe it as. And in this moment, in these moments, I am reminded that I am connected to everyone. I'm connected to my heart. And from this place, and if I, con if I do connect in this way, then I am able to serve from this point of view and from this energy for the rest of my day. So the conversations I have, the business I do, the meetings I have aren't from a, I need to get money from you. I need to make a sale. I need to be above you. I need to compete with you. It's all from a place of, I am you. You're just another, um, you're just a, another experience of who I am. So this is very deep and, and spiritual, but this is uh, what I have experienced over the years. And it, it's an important practice for me because it grounds me back into who I really am. And then if I serve from this place, whilst living the life of Alex Crockford, I am able to, to be a better person. So sometimes it is just a meditation with my eyes closed, listening to some sounds so that I can connect and, and expand. Other times it is a, um, a gratitude practice. If I feel maybe that I need it, I just listen again into intuition thinking, what is it I haven't done for a while? What excites me the most this morning? What do I feel that I need or, or haven't done? And a simple gratitude process is kind of the same as the last one, because it just, you're, you're tapping into a similar frequency and, and energy of, of love and abundance, because when you're grateful for the small things, you are showing and experiencing the fact that you're, you're grateful for everything. So it's very easy for me to just list off 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 small, tiny things and big things, um, which really sets me up mentally um, for the rest of the day. And then other times it could be journaling, which, which is a bit more difficult, but journaling can be gratitude. It probably is the simplest and easiest one for me to do. But other times, you know, I've been practice, practicing a little bit, just opening, opening up the book and, and saying, what is it that I need to channel today? What is it that I need to write? If I write myself a letter, other times it's very, very strategic and, and setting goals, just writing down the things that I really want in, in my five-year plan or, or 10-year plan or visions that I have, like a, like a, a, a vision board and aspects like that. So it's a whole variety. And this has changed and evolved over time. And even to each, each day changes. Oh, that's beautiful. I, this weekend, I read this article and I don't know why I always find this stuff so interesting, but I do. Um, when people are at a place in their life where they're about to transition on, you know, somebody that has terminal cancer or somebody that's just lived a very long life, I find it so inspiring and interesting to capture their thoughts and to try to pull forward some of the life lessons that maybe they would try to bestow upon us because the inevitability is we're all going to die one day. Um, so some people don't like to think about that. I do like to think about that because I think it makes you cherish what we have, which is such an incredible gift. Anyways, there was this woman, she was in, I think it was the Huff a Huffington Post article, but she had uh, she had cancer and she just found out that she only had two months to live and she had a family and she had kids. And so they, anyways, they did this article on her. And then like, she basically said that like, this is what I would hope to share with my kids after the fact that I'm gone. And it was a beautiful article. I mean, definitely a tearjerker, but I remember, and I, I took a bunch of screenshots of it and there was the sort of the last part of the article, which touches on what you were saying here. And this was just once again, a tiny little segment of what she said, but 
in, in verbatim, she said, explore your evolving truths about who you are and what you want and what you need. Don't let decades pass only to realize you haven't been fully present and don't remember who you are or who you have touched or love. Look up when someone calls your name. And it was so interesting because there's this concept of love is so powerful. And I think it's really hard for people that are in dark moments of their life. They're dealing with a mental health issue. They're just not where they want to be. And I think you've even talked about it in a couple of your posts of like, look, it's, you know, when, when everything's going right, it's easy to be optimistic and hopeful. But what, when it, when it doesn't, then what? Um, and I think the practice of gratitude, which is really a practice, right? Because there are some days we don't feel as grateful as others. Um, and even journaling and mindfulness are so powerful because there are days we don't want to do it. But I do think it helps very much the way that you said, bring you back to the bigger picture. That we all are connected, that life is a gift, even the, uh, we'll call them more uh, experiences that are not as joyful. Um, and I think all that's really important because I don't know, we're all going through the human experience. Nobody knows how to do it well. Um, and we all are so connected. Um, so anyways, it's just when you were talking about that, it reminded me of this article I read of like, man, like don't, don't lose sight of the moments that we're in, regardless how hard, hard they are, because they all add up to make us who we are and, you know, lean in with love as much as you can and self-compassion. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, definitely, um, definitely connects and resonates with me with what she said. And, and I'm sure that it, there is a very common thread with when you do extract the thoughts and, and feelings from people on their deathbed or people who are ready to go or know that they are going, it brings this higher perspective of, of what life is and yeah. how we spend a lot of our time <laughs> worrying about the meaningless small yeah. things rather than the big macro things of what life is really about. And um, I, I agree, we should um, comprehend our death and our impermanence, because that alone, and, and accepting and surrendering to that brings us to that higher perspective, and, and helps us think, what do we want to do with our life? What do we want to be remembered for? How do I want to feel if I do get the chance to be on my deathbed, knowing that I've got moments to live? How do I want to Think about my life with pride, with regrets. <laughs> often, often the fear of regrets has been what drives me to take action. Thinking about either my career goals or how I want to be remembered or the people that I have touched. All of these are feelings that drive the small behaviors each day. Yeah, so well said. And actually regret is one of the, there's Bonnie Wears, I want to say she was, uh, I don't know if she worked in a hospice, but she interviewed thousands of people on their deathbed. And one of the common themes, and there are very, very prominent themes that pop up, but regret is one of them, of did I live a life to follow my dreams? And you brought up another one, which is social connection, um, you know, the people that you loved. And it's, uh, I don't know, I find it so encouraging because at the end of the day, we don't get to keep any of this stuff with us. So if you have gold bars and Bentleys and beach houses, guess what? You don't get to take any of it with you. Even your physique, like your body is temporary, right? Your your soul is eternal. And so I don't know, I think it's really important for people to think about that. Uh, I won't go too far off into the spiritual here, but like, let's be honest, it's all of the stuff we have here, we're borrowing it. And so if you really want to live a life that's fulfilling, no regrets is a really big one. And then also just the currency, the most valuable currency you have is the effect you have on other people. And that's one that's like, how do you make the most of that? A um, couple more questions I want to ask you. One is like just mindsets. Is there is there a mindset that really aids you at this point in your life? Is there one that sort of stands above the rest? Right now, what's, what's aiding me is... Um this balance between ambition for more and happy for where I am because for many years driving for success, it was I'll, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy yeah. when, I'll be happy when. And after numerous times getting to the thing that I wanted, realizing I wanted something else, um, made me realize that I'm in the journey for 99% of the time and I only achieve the things a small micro amount of time. There's no point waiting to be happy then, especially as the years went on, realizing that I just keep evolving more desires, which is amazing. And I love that. 
but that gave me the lesson of I need to enjoy life. <laughs> I need to have those desires and be grateful for what I've achieved or grateful for the things around me and where I am now. So this is also a practice. This is also a thing that needs to be learned and experienced because because uh, yeah, I struggle at times to to get in get in this space. Often I'm in my head where I'm searching for the next thing, driving and working hard for the next thing. And often if I'm if I find too much in the in the happy, grateful area, then I be I can become desireless, which maybe is as a a Buddhist would say, well done, <laughs> you're in the right direction. But for me, I feel like where I am in my life, I need those desires and um and I'm pushing for them. But and finding ways to to uh, balance that with enjoyment and life and gratitude and happiness now. That's one. The second one I'll give you I'll give you two. <laughs> the second one is my ability, and I think I've always had this ability, and that is choosing a perspective that's positive in almost all scenarios. And again, this has become a practice and a lesson, is that a lot a lot of negatively wired people would see an annoying positive person as oh their their life is great blah 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 blah. well you try to be positive when this shit happens yeah. to you yeah. <laughs> but the point is is bad things happen to everybody we all have a difficult life we are all on this earth having the the contrast of the difficulties and the challenges but what different differs us is our perspective that we choose and it doesn't mean a decision or a choice is easy because we've had conditioning from our life and our childhood our parents and our environment and all of these things but being aware of them is the first step to to healing that journey and changing your perspective uh, perspective and perception of these challenges so often when i'm faced with difficulties there is sometimes a bubbling of fear and anxiety or shame guilt whatever the scenario is um i am quite good and quick at sitting with myself being aware of my thoughts and thinking what what is what is the lesson what is the thing that i'm being faced with here to grow challenge equals growth and right here in this moment i'm being faced with a difficult situation how am I going to step up and improve who I am, improve this situation for the future? And if people honestly looked at the challenges in their life with this mindset, the world would be a better place because they'd go through the challenge. They'd confront with, with um, compassion. They'd confront with courage and their life would be easier. Do hard things for an easy life or do easy things Love for a hard part. life. And once you take that approach, yeah, it's a great one because it makes you realize that you've got to do these hard things and you can, you can apply that to every aspect of your yeah. life. What I love so much about that quote, and I think I've brought it up at least three or four times on this one, I think about it all the time is hard is in either side of that, right? Do what is easy. Your life is hard. Do what is hard and your life is yeah. easy. There is no way around hard. We're all going to lose people we love. And we're all going to be faced with adversities. Um, and you've got to just choose how you want to approach that. I'm curious for you, when you're, when you're first exposed to some adversity, how are you, you said you bounce back pretty quickly. How are you reconciling your thoughts or making meaning of it? Like, is that in one of your meditation practices that you're doing? Or are you choosing to do it in a different way? Like, how do you choose to like, process that experience if you will to find the lesson or the optimism in it um yeah it can be in actual meditation time but more so in the moments of life when they when they drop in when i have a, a moment here to to have a, a new download or insights like ah oh, maybe maybe this is happening or maybe I'm shown something new 
So it's not in an instant moment. It's just staying open, staying aware. Sometimes I will just, yeah, sit and think, God, what is the lesson? And oftentimes my intuition will tell me straight away, it's like, this is how it feels and, and this is why you've got to do it. <laughs> so often the first thought is is the one that repeats itself rather than it being the, the wrong thought. And I think people could do with with um, trusting their intuition a bit more in these moments. And um, often that does spark up fear. And the fear is often uh, there because the old going through it means change, growth in ways that are scary. And I've learned over, over times that that fear, it, if it's manageable and not enormous, then it's beneficial to lean into a little bit, feel the fear and do it anyway. And if you live a life like this, I'm finding that the universe is just providing incremental levels of fear, incremental challenges that are the 1%. Rarely, I think the universe will provide you a big old massive car crash of a life if you're ignoring it. I feel like if you are listening and you're doing the things in life which you know you should do, go through the challenges, I find it, maybe it's just my life, is, um, is it's the 1% hard, the 1% hard, and then it's the 1% fear. I'm doing something new, but I feel I'm ready for it. It's just being provided with with the things I'm just ready for outside the box, but a slightly bigger box. <laughs> yeah, I find it very helpful to understand some of the neuroscience of how we're designed as people. I've read a lot on neuroscience and by no means I'm an expert um, or <laughs> novice at best, but I find it helpful to recognize like there are certain ways we're just wired as people and fear is part of that wiring. And I think it's helpful to understand like some of the fallacies and the biases that we have as people that are pretty universal, um, fear being one of them, uh, frustration being another one when we're learning something new, to just recognize that like we're all designed this way. It's, it's, it's how can we buck up against that to some extent in a healthy way to sort of push our development. Um, when you were mentioning, uh, when you were talking, I was always thinking that like, Nature is such a profound way that I use to reconcile anything. You know, I've, I've lost a number of family members, my stepmother to cancer, my father-in-law, just so many people. I think of death a lot because we've had so many losses in our lives that I usually, when I'm trying to process that, a run is very healthy for me. I think there's a physical exhaustion that I find very therapeutic. Um, and I actually use running as a way for productive meditation. So I'll just go duck off into nature and you know, I'll see very few people. And I think the combination of physical exertion along with the novelty of nature has a way to help me understand the bigger picture. Um, even though I may not come to like the aha moment in a particular run, um, I find that a couple of those will help me sort of process the emotions behind something. So that's really helpful. But the first thing that you did mention of the, uh, <laughs> the balance between enjoying the journey and having the ambition, um, you know, it's funny because I do vision boards as well. And the dominant theme of my vision board for this stage of my life is enjoying the journey. Because as you well said, you know, I've sold a company and I remember for 15 years and trying to sell the company, all I wanted to do for a good decade was sell the company. That was it. I was just like, I'll be successful when I sell a company and I got on the cover of Forbes magazine and we didn't get on the cover, but we did sell it. And I didn't feel any more successful having sold it and having some big payout. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm a rookie all over again, trying to build the standard. And so I, I really started to recognize, like, I, to your point, I'm in the journey almost 100% of the time. The milestones that we achieve, whatever those may be, promotions, businesses, whatever, they are there for but a moment of our lives. And if all I do is over-index to when that next milestone is going to have... Um, I will have missed out on the vast majority. I would not have been present for an overwhelming portion of my life. And that is really challenging because as you well stated, if you, I think if you over index on enjoying the journey, and I could be wrong here, maybe I haven't done enough Buddha meditation, um, 
But if I over-index on enjoying the moment, will I lose some of the ambition? And is, it, is that even important to lose some of the ambition? Like, I don't know, man. It's a big mm-hmm. mind cluster. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But when you're talking about yeah. it, I totally right. I, I totally, uh, yeah. yeah, I feel the same <laughs> way, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. There's probably lessons for me to learn in, in um, over-leaning in the, in that direction and seeing, yeah, seeing the truth of maybe some of my ambitions. So yeah, there's, there's a constant, a constant learning process. Yeah. Just keep exploring. Yeah. Last question I got for you. Um, I ask all guests the same question, but, um, and I think you'll appreciate it. Um, I, there's a reason why on this podcast and even in what I'm building, I lean so heavily into the individual, habits and mindsets and self-care things people do because i'm i truly do believe if all of us took more time to take care of ourselves you said it earlier fill your cup up i think there's so much you would learn about yourself and there would be so much excess for you to pour into other people's cups and so i do really believe that the way to make the world a better place is to make yourself the best version of you possible whatever that means for you um and so in that spirit the question I have for you to sort of exit this is if you could bestow some habit or some mindset onto all of humanity that you believe would nudge us in a more loving and kind direction, what what would it be? Well, a mindset, first of all, is, well, exactly kind of what you said in the question is the question was, um, what what would it be for all of us to to meet to be more loving etc and like the quote in your behind you on your whiteboard lean into love is just by having this mindset if everybody was to lean into love as their their um their key north star in their life their autopilot then and took all of their habits and routines and behaviors from that place then um then yeah the world will be a very different place and i believe we're going in that direction even though we we see and feel the polarity of of the contrast of that all the time but what does that look like from a habit point of view i'm 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 feeling something around community and and con- connection because although i've spoken a lot about my morning routine which is a very solitude very alone practice which i actually do find my connection to the rest of humanity and and the world so if you can find the connection in that way great but if by being in a um a community or around other people especially ones well you don't know but and the ones you do know like perfect example is when i'm riding the tube in london um, or going through a very busy part of town, um, that's the time to realize t- to that's when to try to lean into love. It's easy to lean into love with the ones that you love. <laughs> it's like it's easy to have a good day when everything's going well. So that the habit that I would I would um, promote or think about is is leaning into love with the people that you're very normally quick to beep your horn and say, why are you driving like that? Or swearing and getting angry or, um, or your, your, or your colleague that you hate, that you're judging. Um, all of these are the moments to, to, um, quickly just sit back and, and, um, assess or be aware of your thoughts and actions because what's happening in the macro from the wars is all happening in the micro in the one-to-one interactions. So, we fix the micro, we'll start fixing the macro on a global humanity scale. So yeah, and I see it all the time. When I go to London and I ride the tube and I, and I see fights and I see people getting all leery with each other, I think, yeah, this is, I'm being aware of how this is all happening in front of me. When I go to a, a festival that's all about spirituality and love and and all of that it's very easy i see everybody hugging i see everybody 
in love. I see lovely music. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's great to be reminded that there are like-minded people. It's great to be reminded that this is how to live. But the real work is out in the world when we, we have judgments with each other. And maybe those judgments can be healed with less judgments on ourselves. The work is ourself first and then outwards. So that's a, a mumbo jumbo answer, but my two pence on, on the topic of leaning into love. No, I, I absolutely appreciate your perspective. Alec, this has been so wonderful to have you on. I, I really appreciate uh, your generosity and the energy you put into this. Um, where can people go to learn a little bit more about you? It's very easy to find me. My name is Alex Crockford and my platforms and channels are Alex Crockford. So you can you can work out with me on YouTube and in my app. Very easy to find on the app stores with my name. And um, yeah, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, YouTube. Yeah, all the rest of it. You'll find me easy and feel free to get in touch with with any any help you need on any of the aspects we've spoken about or anything else. Awesome. Alec, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Standard. Before we go, click on the link in the show notes of this episode to learn more about today's guest. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with somebody who you think would benefit from it as well. 